Whatever happened to Casey? Everyone knows the story of Casey at the bat, but few know what became of him after his epic at bat in 1888 that stunned the nation. Today we will retell that oft-told tale of Casey at the bat and then reveal for the first time what happened to him in the long, lonely decades after. It is a tale that crosses centuries and county lines and spans the full spectrum of human emotion. On a personal note, I first learned the poem some 40 years ago on a challenge from my uncle Warren Muldoon of Lowell, Massachusetts, who had read that Congressman Tip O'Neill of Boston could recite the poem and that it had benefited him throughout life, including later as Speaker of the House alongside President Ronald Reagan. I myself personally have had the opportunity to recite the poem at the commemoration of the poet Ernest Lawrence Thayer's birthplace in, Lowell, in Lawrence, Massachusetts. In more recent years, I've doubled down on the Casey legend, learning Casey 20 years later by Clarence McDonald. I hope you like them both. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning more to play. Then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to that hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey as did also Jimmy Blake. The former was a Lulu and the latter was a cake. So upon the stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake the much despised tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and the men saw what had occurred, there was Johnny safe at second and Flynn a hug in third. Then from five thousand throats and more there went up a lusty yell. It rambled through the valley, it rattled in the dell. It knocked upon the mountains and recoiled upon the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt Twas Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. And while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eyes, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came a-hurtling through the air, but Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey, Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone in the stand, and it's likely they'd have done so had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult, he bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. They knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence, his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. A band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. Somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. And there our story might well have ended. The mighty Casey never played another inning for the Mudville Nine. 
He went back to the stone quarries and coal mines from whence he came and lived out his life in quiet disgrace and humiliation. He was known as Strikeout Casey from the mayor on down the line. But fate is fickle and the road is long, and it is rare that it does not one day turn again. So we pick up the story of the once mighty Casey 20 years later, a different place and time. The Bugville team was surely up against a rocky game. The chances were they'd win defeat and undying fame. Three men were hurt and two were benched. The score stood six to four. They had to make three hard-earned runs in just two innings more. It can't be done, the captain said, a pallor on his face. I've got two pitchers in the field, a mutt on second base. And should another man get spiked or crippled in some way, then we'd sure be down and out with eight men left to play. We're up against it anyhow, as far as I can see. My men ain't hitting like they should, and that's what worries me. The luck is with the other side. No pennant will we win. It's mighty tough, but we must take our medicine and grin. The eighth round opened, one, two, three. The enemy went down. The Bugville boys went out the same. The captain wore a frown. The top half of the ninth came round. Two men had been called out when Bugville's catcher broke a thumb and could not go that route. A deathly silence settled over the crowd assembled there. Defeat would be allotted them, they felt it in the air. With only eight men left to play, t'would be a gruesome fray. Small wonder that the captain cursed the day he learned to play. Lend me a man to finish with, he begged the other team. Lend you a man, the foe replied. My boy, you're in a dream. We want to win the pennant too, that's what we're doing here. There's only one thing you can do, call for a volunteer. The captain stood and pondered in a listless sort of way. He never was a quitter, he would not be today. Is there within the grandstand here, his voice rang loud and clear, a man who has the sporting blood to be a volunteer. Again that awful silence settled over the multitude. Was there a man among them with such recklessness imbued? The captain stood with cap in hand while hopeless was his glance. And then a short and stocky man cried out, I'll take a chance. Into the field he bounded with a step both firm and light. Lend me the mask and mitt, he said, I'll finish up the fight. The game is now beyond recall, I'll last at least a round. Although I'm ancient, you will find me muscular and sound. His hair was sprinkled here and there with little streaks of gray. Around his eyes and on his brows, a bunch of wrinkles lay. The captain smiled despairingly, then slowly turned away. Why, he's all right, one rota yelled, another, let him play. All right, go on, the captain sighed. The stranger turned around, threw off his coat and collar too, and threw them on the ground. The humor of the situation seemed to hit them all. And as he donned the mask and mitt, the umpire cried, play ball! Three balls at him the pitcher threw, three balls of lightning speed. The stranger caught them all with ease and did not seem to heed. Each ball had been pronounced a strike, the side had been called out. And as he went into the bench, he heard the rooter shout. One Bugville boy was out on strikes and one was killed at first. The captain saw his awkward pose and gnashed his teeth and cursed. The third man smashed a double and the fourth man swatted clear. And then in a thunder of applause up came the volunteer. His feet were planted in the earth. He swung a warlike club. The captain saw his awkward pose and softly whispered dub. The pitcher looked at him and grinned, then heaved a mighty ball. The echo of that fearful swat still lingers with us all. High, fast, and far that spheroid flew, it sailed and sailed away. It ne'er was found, so it supposed it floats on to this day. Three runs came in. The pennant would be Bugville's for a year. The fans and players gathered round to cheer the volunteer. What is your name, the captain asked. Tell us your name, cried all, as down his cheeks great tears were seen to run and fall. For one brief moment he stood still then murmured soft and low, I'm mighty Casey, who struck out just 20 years ago.